if you've been looking for a dev board in the same form factor and price of the Arduino, but for learning about RISC-V architecture, then boy, do I have the board for you. Today, we're talking about the RED-5 board by SparkFun, which hosts the Freedom E310 32-bit RISC-V processor, as well as an embedded Seger J-Link for debugging. In this video, we'll go from start to finish, and I'll show you how to set up your build chain and write code for this board, and show you how to use it to learn RISC-V assembly. Also, follow along with the tutorial and watch till the end because you don't even actually need the board to run this code. I'll show you how to emulate it in this video as well. Before we start, I want to talk about the board a little bit, just kind of show you the parts. Here on the right is that Seger J-Link I was talking about built into the chip, and on the left is a Freedom E310, a wake button to bring the board out of a deep sleep, and then a reset on the right. I'll also show you here that there is a USB-C adapter, pretty cool, the first board that I've ever had that has a USB-C adapter as opposed to micro. And then we'll show you the form factor of this board compared to others. So pretty, pretty regular size. If I bring it over and compare it to the Arduino, you'll see it's almost a perfect match when compared to the form factor of an Arduino. And then putting the Arduino down, we'll take a look at the uh, Raspberry Pi Pico as well and see the comparison there. And one more thing before we go, it's hard to talk about this board without talking about its specifications. So first, this thing comes equipped with a Freedom E310 32-bit RISC-V core. Also, 32 megabytes of QSPI flash, pretty cool. It's a lot of room for a lot of applications. As previously mentioned, an onboard Seger debugger to get an interface into the chip for on-chip debugging. A clock on the chip, clockable up to 150 megahertz airing near uh, you know, early generation laptops, pretty and crazy clock speeds, and then obviously your standard uh, peripherals, be it UART, pulse of modulation, etc. All right, and with all that fun out of the way, let's put these boards down and let's write some code. Okay guys, let's get coding. So to get started, we're gonna actually plug the board in here, and I wanna show you guys, when you plug the board in, you actually get two devices. They'll show up, for me at least, as dev TTY ACM0 and ACM1. So ACM0 is actually going to be the character device that is the serial port on the RISC-V board. So if you print anything with printf or puts or write to the UART base, it'll show up here. I'll actually show you how to get that. All you have to do is type minicom, if you have minicom installed, tack capital D, and then the device path. It's locked. I'm going to actually show you the right window. Here we go. So I'm going to pull it over here. Um, and we are going to reset the board and you will see that once the board comes up, it'll actually run my program. So this right here is the bootloader running and then this is the actual output of my program here, low level gang. So we're going to write the program that gets this printed onto the UART bus of the uh, device. So the way we start doing that is we need to first install a few things. First thing we got to install is the RISC. 64-bit toolchain and we'll use that 64-bit toolchain to produce 32-bit binaries for our board. So do that sudo apt install gcc tac risk 5 hit tab a few times and you'll see this risk 564 unknown elf build chain. We're going to take that and install it. I'll type my password here. You hackers don't get to know it and I already have it installed. So nothing happens here. Okay, so now we actually get to write some code. So what we have to do is, you know, start a project just as we would any other way. Uh, we'll use two files today. The first is hello.s. It'll be our source file for where the code actually lives. And then red5.ld. That ld is called a linker file. And I'll tell you what that does a little later in the video. To get started here, we need to do some basic assembly programming setup. So the first is align two. That just means we have to bank every piece of this code aligned to a two byte boundary. That's to keep the processor happy and not hit an edge fault when we're writing through our code. Um, also, we're going to make a variable and we're going to call it urregtxfifo. And this is just the offset into the UART structure on the board. And then also we need to get the address of that UART structure, which I'll pull up the uh, user guide here and show you where I got this, but it's basically at 1001, 3000. We're going to start our code in the text section and we're going to define a global symbol called start. And start will actually be the entry point to our code where our code begins to run. And we'll start to actually write out that code. Uh, step one, the processor actually boots with multiple threads running. So we want to make sure we only actually run with the first thread. If we have every thread running this code, the code will try to write multiple things to the UART bus and we'll get some weird corruption in our message. So we are going to move the control register, so special register move, into T1, the M heart ID. This is the machine hardware thread ID into T0. 
And then basically, if that thread number is not zero, we're gonna move to a label called halt. And halt will just be a label that jumps to itself. So basically, if we are not the zero with thread, so if we're only, if we're the other threads, we will go to halt and then halt forever. Pretty cool, okay. So then we are going to set up our stack pointer. So again, the device needs memory to function. Right now, the device has no stack. There's memory and there's RAM on the device. We haven't told the device where its stack exists. So we're gonna initialize the stack by saying, SP will start at this stack top symbol, and I'll define that later in the linker script. We're going to also, call a function that we're gonna write called puts, and the argument to puts is going to go into A0, so we're gonna load the address of this message. We're gonna call it message into A0. So load address of message into A0. That message is going to live in the .ro data section, or read-only data. Gonna call it message, and it's just gonna be a string. And we're gonna say low level gang, boom. And a new line to print the, uh, you know, the end of the, the character turn there. Cool, so we have that, boom. And then, so I said, we're gonna call a function we're gonna write, and we're gonna call that function puts. So we are going to jump and link, that's what the L means in the jump and link. So it means we are calling and not just far jumping to a function called puts. And here we're gonna define that puts function. So what puts is gonna do is puts is actually going to look at the UART base and it's gonna index into the UART FIFO. And if there is already data there, it's going to wait. And if there's not data there, meaning it's clear to send or ready to send, we're gonna put data there. So first we need to load immediate into a temporary register, so T0, the address of the UART base. So we're gonna use T0 to index into the UART structure and use that to see, hey, is there any data that we need to load or load out of that part of the structure. So then we're gonna start a puts loop here. And the puts loop is basically gonna be, hey, we're gonna load a byte that's unsigned, that's what this means, it's load byte unsigned, uh, into T1 from A0. It basically says we're gonna pull out a byte from our message. Remember, A0 at this point contains the message, so we're gonna pull out a byte from A0, and it's gonna go into T1. And then, just like in anything else in C or assembly, all strings are null terminated, meaning at the end, there's a null byte right here that tells us, hey man, the string's over. So if we get a null byte out of T1 or in T1 currently, we're going to leave the function, meaning we're done. If, we, if we've now gotten to the null byte here, we have transmitted the entire string. So basically, branch equal to zero. If T1 equals zero, meaning it's a null byte here, we are going to branch to a symbol we write called puts leave and puts leave is just a ret instruction. That's it. It's literally just, hey man, we're done. We can return now. And that ret is gonna go back to code execution after our call to puts, it'll be right here. So now we need to actually incorporate the writing function, right? So we basically said, if we load from the end of the string, leave, but now we have to actually do the rest of the functionality. And what we're gonna do is we have to first incorporate logic that waits for the UART buffer to be clear. Like I said before, you can put data into this FIFO, but it doesn't mean necessarily that it immediately gets pushed out. You are limited by the baud rate of the serial bus there, right? So what we're gonna do is we're going to load a word into T2 from the UART register FIFO offset by T0. What that's gonna do, and again, so T0 contains the UART base and this is going to offset into the TX FIFO. So basically, if we get a negative number out of there, so if it's less than zero, we are going to branch to puts wait. Basically, the FIFO is, meant, is set up to tell us if something is already in there by returning a negative value out of that buffer. Again, we're gonna send ASCII over there. We can't put negative values there, but what it's gonna do here is if we get a negative value, it is still being used. So once that is you know, no longer the case, we can continue going through our loop. So if there is not a null byte and the buffer is not full, now we can actually put stuff there. And the way we do that is we store word SW, the current contents of a character in our string. And at this point, T1 has the latest character from our loop, right? If we took T1 out and it was not equal to zero, we're down in this part of the code now and T1 still has the character we wanna put. So we're gonna do store word T1 into UART register FIFO offset by T0. This is the same thing here. We're gonna index into T0 by this amount. So this will actually put the character on to the UART bus. And then from there, all we have to do is add 
one to a zero because a zero is a pointer to our message and that message will be now incremented up by one to get to the second character. And then all we have to do is jump to puts loop and do it all over again. That's pretty much it guys, that's the code. But the question is now, how do we get it onto the board? This gets a little more complicated as we need to form the binary in a way that the board is able to actually consume. So pretty cool actually, when you plug your board into your computer, you will get a drive here called Hi5, just like the Raspberry Pi Pico. I can drop a file into this uh, directory here and that will actually burn the code to the board and reset the board to run the code. The problem is the question is, you know, what format is that code? The Hi5 expects you to put a hex file into this folder here. So we have to get this code into a format that the board can consume in a hex file. The first step to do that is we need to create what is called a linker script. A linker script puts the code into a form that the board knows how to handle. So for example, we made this text section here and it has a global start, but what memory address does this text section live at? What memory address does this RO data section live at? We need to describe in the linker file, where do you put these blocks of code? And that is dependent on where the chip expects code to live. So I'll show you in the manual here, our code is actually expected to be at hex 2001-0000, and that is a function of the bootloader code that sets up the board and jumps over to your code. So we need to write a linker file that tells the compiler to build an elf that way. So what we'll do here is step one, we'll tell the linker, hey man, RISC-V architecture, pretty simple. Step two, we'll tell the linker, what format should this binary be in? It's gonna be an elf32, little endian risk five binary, very simple. Now we're gonna tell it, okay, what is the entry point to our code? And the entry point is the symbol start. And again, that start symbol is just right here. It means that when the elf is created, the entry point will be to go to this location. Now we're going to declare, where do the sections go in memory? And again, this is a section here, section text. And then this is a section here, RO data. They represent different parts of the board. We need to describe where on the board they go in memory. So by putting dot, we're saying the current location is hex 2001-0000. This tells the linker that we are going to start memory at this location. And now I'm telling it we are going to put all of the text segments, or text sections rather, into this part of the code. We're also gonna put the GNU build ID. It's just an easy way to make sure that the elf is sane. It has the hash of the uh, elf that we are creating. And this actually won't go onto the board. We're gonna strip this away when we obj copy at the end, but that's not important. And also the RO data, remember that's where our, our section for our uh, message is gonna go. It's also gonna go pretty close to this text section right next to this part of the memory. So RO data will go here. Okay, so that's where the text and RO data are gonna go, but now we have to move the cursor, if you will, in linker script to a different location where RAM is going to be. And RAM is going to be starting at this location, and this is where our stack is going to be. So we're gonna put the data, which means it's the dynamic memory of the program, the data section. Also the S data for the static data needs to go here as well and then also the debug information, which will get stripped away, but still important to have in the binary somewhere, dot debug, we need to capture that. And then we're going to create a thousand bytes. So remember again, the dot is a cursor, plus hex 1000 bytes, and the stack top, remember that symbol we used up here, the SP? The stack top symbol is going to be a location in the linker file that represents a pointer to the current place in RAM. And this is where the RAM will be allocated for our heap, or excuse me, for our stack to live. And then finally, we create a symbol called end that just shows you the end of the binary. So we have a linker script now that declares how to form our binary in a way that the board knows how to process. We also have our code to tell the board what to do. Now we need to combine the two using the commands to make the binary be created. So we'll move this to the right to show you guys how to do that. Step one, risk 64 unknown elf, GCC. This is our compiler. We need to also tell it to make the architecture a risk 5 32 bit and then G at the end for the you know variant that we're on. Uh, the machine ABI, it needs to be this ABI. We're going to statically compile our board or our program. The microchip model is going to be a Medani F visibility 
hidden. That's basically gonna make sure that certain parts of our code don't get shown for no reason. No standard lib. This means that we are not going to link lib C into our program. That'll keep the program A from having, having dependency issues, but also B, make the program really, really small. No start files, meaning we're going to incorporate no other additional code. We need to tell it to use our linker script, which is right here with the tack capital T. We're gonna use red5.ld. We are going to tell it that we're going to use the hello.s code. Again, that's our code right here. And we're going to output a hello binary. Okay, so just warning us that I didn't put a new line at the end of the uh, code here. I'll add that to make the assembler happy. Okay, so what have we done? We have produced a hello binary, but what did I say before? The board actually expects a hello.hex file. So we need to make this file a hex file by copying out the relevant parts into a different file format. The way we do that is with the object copy command. So unknown elf obj copy, tack capital O, for the format you're going to output, it will be ihex. It will take in our hello and then output hello.hex. Should be no issues there, very cool. And then we are just gonna literally copy that hello.hex file onto the board here. We will do that, this will go copy hello.hex onto media user high five. Hit enter. And then I'll have uh, my mini com up to show you guys. Oh, we gotta wait for the board to come back to life. And while we wait, as promised, I wanted to show you guys how to actually run this code if you don't physically own the board. I know a lot of you don't. By using the program Kimu, we can actually use our code without having the board present. We have to make one minor modification to our code. Normally on the code on the physical board, it loads at this address here. We have to change it to an address that Kimu can process. We change it from 2001 to 2040, and then we run our compilation command one more time to produce a new hello binary. From there, we can actually use Kimu system risk 532 to run our code. We do that by saying we want to first use machine help and we're going to choose the side 5 e We're going to say no graphic to suppress the Kimu graphic display by default. We're going to say BIOS none to not use a BIOS and we'll use a kernel that is just going to be our hello program. And by hitting enter, we see that our code does actually run without the board physically here. Pretty cool. Now back to the real board. Low level gang. Guys, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do me a favor, hit that sub button if you wanna learn more about the RISC-V architecture or this board in general. Also, check out my merch store and follow me on Twitch. Guys, I'll see you next time. Take care.